Greetings and salutations. Allow me the privilege of introducing myself to you all out there. I'm JTR Raps. Raps. No, I'm not about to play any beats or spit lyrics, so if that's what you came here for, I'm sorry. It's a pro wrestling channel. News and rumors, weekly television, and pay-per-view recaps. True stories. I'm about to tell you one of them right now. I appreciate you all stopping by and taking a chance on what I have to say. So to that, I say to you, big ups and salute. B-roll footage, please. That's these football player. They don't lose them. They start losing. No, they don't lose them. You know what? I came out here. I told you. The Red we do suck. So do the Detroit Pistons. And so do the Detroit Lions. And don't forget about them sorry-ass Tigers. Hey, uh, Harrison, you trying to put me out of, out of a job here? I didn't even ask you a question. Shut up! This is my time! Hey, wait a second. I'm the baddest brother on the block. Bello, I'm a Georgia Brown. This is natural. Bello, I'm the baddest man on the planet. You have had two fights. Two first-round knockouts. Look, they're you my have... fights. I don't know where they find them has been. They washed up. You know who I need next. Oh. You, you Hard body Harrison. Let's see. How can I describe Hard body Harrison? Tough man winner. Soldier. Former sports entertainer, professional wrestler, enhancement talent, jobber, former WCW talent, and world-class athlete. Uh, pimp, sex trafficker, manipulator, sheep, and wolf's clothing. Those are just some of the words you could use to describe the man known as Hard Body Harrison. Now... Back when he was an active pro wrestler, he was a part of an elite class of talented pro wrestlers in WCW or World Championship Wrestling. I was a huge WCW fan in the 90s. The only shows I'd been to, we didn't have WWF. They were based out of Hartford, Connecticut. I lived in North Carolina. WCW was in Atlanta. So we had access to WCW. I can remember going to see Cactus Jack, Abdullah the Butcher, the York Foundation. Y'all know nothing about that. Uh, beautiful Bobby Eaton, the man they call Sting, Ravishing Rick Rude. They were all there. This was an elite class of talent. And Hardbody Harrison, albeit a jobber or what we used to call them as kids, nobodies, was a part of this legendary roster. Now, Hardbody Harrison's legacy, however, will not turn out to be so story. On the 16th of June, 2006, Harrison Norris, a.k.a. Hardbody Harrison, was charged with 28 counts of breaking the law in connection with his part, along with two co-conspirators, which we'll get to a little later, and forcing and attempting to force multiple women to engage in prostitution. This was in and around Atlanta, Georgia from 2004 through 2006. Let me paint this picture for you as far as what he was charged with. The charges included conspiracy, holding five young women in a condition of peonage, which is like using labor for servitude because of debt, obtaining the forced labor and services of six young women, trafficking of six young women for the purposes of peonage and forced labor, trafficking of six young women for commercial sex acts, tampering with witnesses, and last but certainly not least, obstructing a peonage investigation. You name it, he was alleged to have done it, tried, and convicted of it. But what do we know about Mr. Hardbody's humble beginning? Allow me to take you on a trip down memory lane. Let's go back to the year 1966. Our body Harrison was born Harrison Norris Jr. on August 22nd, 1966 in Kennesaw, Georgia and was relocated to Pensacola, Florida where he graduated from high school. Following graduation, he enlisted in the military. He was a service member in the U.S. Army in which he served in such privileged positions as motor sergeant and platoon sergeant, which means he was a leader. I'm an active duty service member in the Army, so when I hear positions such as those, for instance, those are positions that are usually reserved for senior NCOs or your non-commissioned officers. In order to reach those heights, you have to have served anywhere between 7 and 12 years at a minimum. He was a leader of troops, which meant he was serving in a position of power. Remember that for later on in the story. He also served in the Gulf War in Saudi Arabia, where he likely saw action in combat. This man could have very well served with my dad in Desert Storm, which I may have to ask him about that, but moving right along. Once he transitioned from the service back to Georgia, he trained to be a pro wrestler, 
straight to the WCW power plant in 1995 in Atlanta. The power plant was owned and operated by the now defunct WCW and produced such athletes and superstars, the likes of Bill Goldberg, the big show known as the Giant in WCW, and Molly Holly. He later debuted with the alias of Hard Body Harrison as an enhancement talent, jobbing to Disco Inferno, Kevin Sullivan, and others. In all fairness, though, he was featured on WCW Nitro, The Road to Uncensored, and according to his Wikipedia page, he appeared in WCW's highest grossing pay-per-view at the time, Star K97, but I didn't see him featured in any of the matches on the card. I even scoured through the archives on the WWE Network, and he was nowhere to be found. If y'all know something I don't, please, by all means, place it in the comments. In 2000, Sonny Ono, if you don't remember him, he was the manager in WCW between 95 and 99 who managed the promotion's Japanese talent. He had the signature look of a pro wrestling manager with the stylist suit and shades, managed wrestlers out of Japan with limited English speaking skills like Jushin Thunder Liger and Masahiro Chono. Ono actually filed a racial discrimination lawsuit. He filed a multi-plaintive lawsuit on behalf of WCW performers like Bobby Walker, who was also produced by the power plant, and the nephew of Thunderbolt Patterson, if you recall who he is. Hard Body Harrison, of course, and several other African-American talent alleging racial discrimination against AOL Time Warner, their former employer. It was ultimately settled out of court and Harrison received a healthy settlement. Following the death and acquisition of WCW by WWE in 2001, Harrison retired, unceremoniously, might I add, from professional wrestling. In other words, his contract wasn't picked up. His days are far from numbered, though, as he continued to compete in Tough Man competitions, a series which was featured on FX and actually captured their heavyweight championship. It's worth noting that Harrison, still employed by WCW during the time, and competed on the Tough Man show between 1999 and 2001. He captured their top prize in 2000. When it came to the legitimacy of the man, he was the real deal. You can go and look up Hard Body on YouTube and watch some of his old footage, and you'll see he was a very charismatic guy. Case in point, there is a match which you can watch on YouTube with Hard Body Harrison going up against the late Brian Christopher. So Hard Body comes to the ring, drip is undeniable. Guy's solid as a rock. He's a brick house, right? He's got the black cat to the front with the initials HB in yellow. He's got the old school braids with the bees like Tresh from Naughty by Nature. He's got yellow wrestling attire that are like half tights, half trunks, shirtless. I mean, to me, he didn't look like a jobber and looked every bit as uh, impressive as a guy like Brian Christopher did back in those days. But check this out though. This may have been a sign of things to come. He's accompanied to the ring, not by a manager, not by a coach or a valet, but by two ladies of the night. Imagine that. In 2007, and seemingly out of nowhere, the man known as Hard Body Harrison was convicted of charges of recruiting and forcing eight women into prostitution and working for Norris as servants in his two homes in Cartersville, Georgia. Some sources state Norris had as many as 10 victims, all ranging in age from 19 to 27, all American, all females, all anonymous. Although he was charged and convicted in 2007, he's alleged to have been running his prostitution business since 2001 at the time. It's proclaimed that Norris lured these women with false promises of training them to become successful professional wrestlers in his imaginary all-female wrestling promotion. Now, back to these co-conspirators. One of the co-conspirators, Cedric Jackson, was charged with and convicted of kidnapping at least one victim and providing her to Norris. Now, obviously, no stranger to military structure, Let's relate that to how each of these women were treated. It's proclaimed that Harrison assigned each of his victims to squads overseen by a team leader, a woman named Amy Allen, who was the other person who conspired with Norris to keep these women in servitude. Forced acts of prostitution occurred in various establishments like nightclubs and trailer homes all over North Carolina and parts of Northern Georgia. They profited off of these women, kept them isolated from family and friends, and confiscated their identifications and phones. It gets worse. You know that military structure I was talking about? Well, Norris forces victims into laborers and made them work to pay off their quote unquote debts. He had a set of strict rules he enforced in and around his homes and fined them for what he deemed as infractions like talking too much during scheduled labor and failing to exercise. 
wouldn't surprise me at all if he had these women out there in formations conducting roll call exactly like they do in the military. This guy portrayed the real life role of a military tyrant with total control of his victims, physically and psychologically. And that's not all. Manual labor included such activities as hauling trees. Yes, he had these women out there hauling trees outside of and around his property, laying down sod, field work, oh, and painting. He also kept them indebted to him by charging them funds for food, medicine, cigarettes. And he was charging them for rent. Of course, he finessed them all by saying they could leave once their debts had been paid off, all the while increasing the debt he claimed they owed, just an endless cycle of mind games and false hope, just to use and abuse his victims over and over again. To add insult to injury for the abuse victims, Norris opted to represent himself and serve as his own lawyer once the case went to trial. Although the success rate of representing oneself is very low, by representing himself, he's not bound to the same ethical codes as lawyers are. When you represent yourself, you can repeatedly file motions and ultimately delay proceedings. Not to mention the intimidation factor because the victims essentially have to relive the nightmare of what they've gone through. Just by listening to this man defend his actions, cross-examine them, and treat them as hostile in a way he can reassert his control over these young women. During the trial, Norris gave the excuse that these women came to his homes willingly. I mean, look, you promised them success and notoriety as pro wrestlers and you have some credentials. Of course, they're going to come willingly. He said most of them arrived on drugs and left in the best shape of their lives or words to that effect. One witness even testified that Harrison beat them and threatened to throw one of them through a hotel window when she initially refused to have sex with two of the customers. A federal jury convicted the pimp formerly known as Harbody Harrison of charges that he kept these women as slaves under lock and key in his two Georgia homes. Now, each of the trafficking convictions, which I believe there were 19 of them, carried a life sentence and he was initially sentenced to life in prison. However, following an exhaustive hearing of the facts of the case, the district court sentenced Norris to a total of 35 years imprisonment, lifetime supervision, and $2,400 in fines. This was federal, and in federal cases, there is no parole, but nevertheless, prisoners can still earn a reduced term for good behavior. His co-conspirators, Amy Allen, sentenced to three years, Cedric Jackson, sentenced to five years. Norris appealed to vacate his sentence twice, but those cries fell on deaf ears. Both motions denied. Hardbody Harrison is currently in prison in the Federal Correctional Institution in Manchester, Kentucky. His new gimmick, inmate number 575-04019. And that, my friends, is the end of his chapter in this story. If you made it all the way through with me, I appreciate y'all for sticking around for my interpretation of the case. I'll be back with more stories, more goodies. We're just getting started, y'all. And as we continue to build this channel and take it into the not-so-distant future. Until then, that's my time. I'm out of here.